All right, I think we're going to get started. Good morning, all. Eric, we have about a dozen people in the room, and we're recording this uh, for posterity. I'm Liz Altman, and I just wanted to thank you all for being here and particularly thank uh, Eric and congratulate Eric on being chosen this year as our Knowledge and Innovation uh, Foundation Scholar. This is a project that's been going on for a number of years where we honor a scholar who's had kind of a large impact foundation, as we say, foundational, it's done foundational work on our field. And we chose uh, the leadership of the interest group, got together and chose Eric to be honored this year. So Eric, thank you very much for agreeing to, to accept our honor and for being awake at, and, uh, <laughs> and available at six in the morning in Boston. Eric wasn't able to be here. and We tried to push this as late as we could, but this was as late as, as we were able to do it. So Eric gets uh, super bonus points for the six in the morning, uh, probably the 5.30 wake up call and the six in the morning appearance. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that. And then I also want to really thank uh, our two doctoral students here, Nettie Wu and Jens Kristen uh, Friedman, who have done Yeoman's work putting together an interview of Eric. So when we asked them to do this, we said, you know, uh, will you please do this? And basically they do all the heavy lifting and all the real work of putting together uh, the story and interviewing Eric. So we're recording this and we'll have it available on the website and just wanted to um, thank you all for being here and really hand it over to you guys to do the interview. Thanks again. And we're going to do, we're gonna have you guys do the interview and then we'll do Q and A or you can explain the process. Thanks. Thank you, Liz, for the great introduction and for the nice work. And it's our honor to have uh, Professor Erivan Hippo to join us for the uh, Foundation Scholar interview today. Um, so um, just a bit overview about the interview structure. We'll give a brief introduction about Eric's uh, work and his background, and then we'll start with the interview. And finally, we'll have a, a short Q&A session so our audience can also uh, engage in a conversation and have a conversation with Eric. So, um, Professor Erivan Hippo is the T. Wilson Professor of Innovation Management at the MIT Sloan um, School of Management and also a Professor of Management of Innovation and Engineering System at MIT. He is known for his research on the sources of innovation, especially user innovation. He has written um, three books and published many articles on these topics with a focus on the nature and economics of user innovation, disruptive innovation, and also free innovation. We will dive into details later in the interview about all these concepts. All the books are published under the Creative Commons license, which means that um, the electronic copies can actually be obtained by one at no cost. So this is also um, a signal of re Eric's research on open source and free innovation. Um, Eric holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard College, a master's degree from MIT, and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. He also received uh, numerous honors and academic prizes, such as uh, the Hombon Foundation Research Prize, the EU Innovation Luminary Award, the Schumpeter School Prize, and the Portugal National Medal of Science. Um, we also wanted to um, show Eric's impact in a statistical sense. So uh, we have statistics from Google Scholar, which show that Eric has over 86,000 citations in total. Um, two of his books, uh, Sources of Innovation and Democratizing Innovation, have received over 10,000 citations. His top cited articles relate to the concept of lead users, stick information, and open source. On SSRN, Eric also ranked among the top 400 with over 67,000 downloads. Eric is also a fellow at the Open and User Innovation Society, which focuses on research related to innovation process by users and the open sharing of innovation via Innovation Commons. So um, I will then um, pass on to um, Jens about the Eric's research journey. Okay. Um, thank you, Neti, for for that introduction. So, um, in the, in this slide, you can see a very brief and high level summary of Eric's research journey, 
And um, Eric has, as you can see here, pioneered several groundbreaking concepts in the field of innovation, such as user innovation, open source innovation, free innovation, and most recently, the idea of need solution pairs. And linked to these ideas are several concepts that have been at least as impactful at these major ideas, such as the idea of the lead user, which was actually the first idea of Eric I was personally um, subjected to in a way. Um, then, of course, also the concept of sticky information of innovation toolkits, which then leads to self rewards, freely revealed innovation and the idea of innovation communities. And Eric has published these ideas through countless research papers, as Nitti has shown just before, and also through three remarkable books that are um, really some milestones of his research journey, as you can see in this slide. Um, and as we can see here also, Eric's research journey has basically started with user innovation. And Eric here, indeed, you're probably best known also for user innovation. And can you perhaps give us a brief definition of what user innovation is and how we can contrast it with a producer innovation? Yeah, it, 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 I first have to say, uh, if I may, that um, I did all this work with colleagues. We have a wonderful community of people. Um, in the beginning, it was sort of a small community, uh, but uh, as Jens says, eventually he was inflicted. Uh, why did you say Jens? <laughs> the first thing that you were inflicted of with respect to my work is uh, lead users or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> that upon, yeah. <laughs> so we built our community over time to the point now where people regularly get inflicted with uh, various concepts. But the, um, to your point, the user innovation is really quite a lovely thing. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that producers innovate. Ever since Schumpeter, that's been the conventional wisdom. And uh, it's, it's, so user innovation is sort of turning it around and saying, no, 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 we're not, we're not afflicted by this kind of waiting around for producers to do what we need. Actually, we as users are increasingly empowered and able to innovate. So there are lots of strategy related implications of this and it's really an exciting and growing area now. And so of course I encourage you all to abandon whatever you're doing in unless you're already doing this and then start doing this. But user innovation then, let me, maybe what I'll do, can I, um, uh, let me share slides for just a minute because I think I can illustrate user innovation pretty easily, if I may, but sure. okay, so let me share. So first, uh, here's Schumpeter at his uh, most cheerful, um, and uh, you can see what he's saying. He's saying it's the producer who initiates economics change and consumers are educated by him as necessary. And by the way, I knew that wasn't so because I was a user innovator. Uh, but I wanna show you what we all did as a community. Again, this was not just me. Um, we surveyed 10 countries so far, we're working in, in, in now in South Africa as well, to see if user innovation existed in the household sector because it wasn't supposed to exist. And what we found in these surveys was that in fact, it was massive. The first one we did was the United Kingdom. And as you can see there, it's 2.9 million people reporting that they have developed or an improved or new product for themselves. Now to put that into context, there are only 23,000 R&D personnel in the United Kingdom working on developing innovations for consumers. So consumer innovators outnumber them by over a hundred to one. This massive phenomenon was totally hidden 
until relatively recently. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how to link user innovation with producer innovation and strategies to do it and so on. But I wanna give you some examples, just three or four. These are the kinds of things that users do for themselves as individuals. And uh, so you see here, uh, this is a Chinese farmer who was tired of dragging his bag around airports. He thought, why not have my bag drag me around? And so he then publicized this thing. And what he did was he integrated a scooter, electric scooter with his suitcase and went zipping around and proudly said that he could go through like 28 kilometers or something like that. Now, instantly, and you can see again why user innovation is hidden, instantly what happened was companies like this one, Motobag, started to say, ah, we have developed the suitcase. You can buy it from us and it's really marvelous. Now, they weren't trying to be awful about it. You know, they just had no incentive to advertise the Chinese farmer but we all get the impression that it's producer innovation because they are the ones who advertise. Here's one in uh, Russia. In Russia, when you're in Siberia, you cannot get around. I mean, it's half bog, it's half snow, it's ice. And so what they did was they built these floating vehicles. You know, it can actually, run across lakes, it can run across ice, it can, and uh, there are thousands of these of all sorts of varieties, home-built in Siberia. Uh, this is really important because the earlier, the earlier ones here talk about single innovations, but we all have to understand that what people are doing is building systems. They are participating in systems. The individual innovations are part of systems and really as important as the industrial revolution. Here's an example from Bangladesh where more and more everybody's having to live aquatically. You know, they're flooding now 30% of the year, 30% of the country. So what do you do? So these rural people, developed floating fields. They sort of said, well, okay. And you can see each of these floating fields is sort of lined up there in a row on the water where you can plant crops. And the way they did it, you see in the bottom square on the right, which is you take water hyacinth, which floats. And then you put some bamboo on it to give it structure. And then you put more hyacinth on top and also manure and so on to act as the dirt on which the plants will grow. So we are sitting around talking about individual innovations like, yes, I can make myself a mountain bike, but it's all part of this larger context where in fact, you know, who's having to live aquatically? It's not the producers. What are you going to do as the water is rising around your door? And so what you can then see is that this starts to improve. People add on. So here again in Bangladesh, they started using containers to help float this stuff instead of hyacinths, which they had to renew every year. And so they have plants growing there on a, on a bamboo frame. And then within these frames, between these fields, they have both fish and ducks. So they end up with both vegetables and protein in this, in effect, floating farm. The ducks give eggs and, and uh, the fish are, 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 you know, sort of a regular diet thing. So that's really what I want to point out, that what happens is that innovation, which was hidden by users, in fact, leads innovation by producers because users hit the problem first and manufacturers are not sure if there's a market. And so what we all in a strategy sense, what you see here across the top is that a lot of this stuff is just free, like my books. 
you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's self-rewarded innovation. That nobody's paying them to do it. They're saving themselves in the water. Other people copy, share, improve. And then you have peer-to-peer -peer free diffusion. And also from the strategy point of view of companies, there's a tremendous amount, as I showed you in that moto bag thing, there's a tremendous amount of the innovation that companies do that actually comes from users without credit. So it's a new shift. We finally got the OECD to include it in their definition of innovation. That was a hassle. So that's what I wanted to sort of give you as an intro. So thank you, Nettie and gents. I'll stop sharing now. Thank, thank you so much, Eric, for this excellent introduction to user innovation. Um, then as the follow-up to this, um, we want to ask on a more personal side, um, how did you come up with the concept of user innovation and why is it so important to you as a person? And perhaps also what were some of the challenges you faced when introducing that concept to the innovation community. <laughs> yes. So I started out as a kid uh, innovating all the time. If I, if I, you know, I was one of those kids, I'm sure many others, you know, are also, uh, maybe you two are, and some Nettie, I don't know. But I mean, if I wanted to build myself a bicycle with a jet engine on it, uh, I tried my best, you know, I began to, I borrowed my mother's vacuum cleaner, much to her dismay, because I used the wand and converted it into a jet engine tube. But anyway, uh, so when I came across Schumpeter in studying economics, who was saying it's the producer who innovated, I knew that was wrong. I just knew, let's say it was incomplete. So right away, it was like, wait a minute here. This is just wrong. And then another thing that motivated me was that user innovation is a good thing. It's empowering. It gives us all sort of a sense that we don't have to stand around waiting for producers. We can do it ourselves. And in fact, we do do it ourselves. So... To me, it had those two qualities that was really nice. Uh, you know, one was, hey, it's really there. And the other was, it's valuable. It's, it's, it's for human flourishing and so on. And to your other point, Jens, uh, no, nobody welcomed this idea with glad cries. Nobody. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> First, you know, and, and we built a community. So again, I, all the insults were not aimed at me. They were also aimed at others. I'm happy to share those as well. But it was like, first of all, that's not true. And then it was like, well, that's true in narrow areas like scientists, but it's not important. And then it was so fun because when we finally did the, um, you know, the national surveys showing that it was really important in scale as well as scope. I had a colleague who will remain nameless who was always explaining to me that it didn't mean anything. And he said, well, that's nothing. That's just people being people. And I said, that's right. That's right. And so that's where we are today. Uh, some people think it's interesting, some don't, but there's a lot of room for scholarship to build it and and anybody who wants to i'd love to chat with and you know help along the way if i can so eric according to you how do you think we can empower users to innovate more and to engage in that user innovation well you know it's really interesting and it's it's happening by exogenous forces because what's going on is that powerful design tools that used to be restricted to manufacturers are now design software, for example, simulation tools are downloadable on the web for free. So what you have is sort of really increasingly powerful tools to innovate, powerful tools to share, 
And what I want to point out too, is that it's not just 13 year olds in the basement of their mother's house and father's house innovating. You know, it is in fact, all those people who have the skills as professional innovators during the day, working in companies, who go home and innovate on what they need to do at a highly professional level at night. So every field you'll see, for example, medical innovation, parents so concerned about their diabetic kids and they develop the better tools. They develop the artificial pancreas. And then the manufacturers finally come in and say, oh, all right. So, so it's, it's not, it is so funny. Can I get, tell you one more brief story? Sure. It, it is so funny. I mean, the skills range from the low end to the high end, right? So it's also true that innovators who are young innovate and notoriously, this was the case with uh, skateboards. You know, skateboarding is a user developed thing. No manufacturer would say, oh yeah, we're gonna give you a board with wheels that you could use to kill yourself, right? This is not, you know, this is not liability proof from a manufacturer's perspective. But the, the skateboards started out narrow. They started out with these boards about this wide on skates. And uh, they got wider, however. And one way they got wider was really funny because a 13 year old was making boards for his friends. And each time he made a board, he used that to draw the outline of the next board. And so each time he did it, it got a pencil width wider without his noticing. And people started saying, wait, these wider boards are much better. And so innovation occurs at the both the sophisticated, high-tech, artificial pancreas level. And at the, oh my God, you know, I'm a 13-year-old, look what I did. So exciting both ways. So as we have also shown on this brief research map, initially, besides user innovation, you have also introduced some really other important concepts, such as the lead user, the sticky information, or the innovation toolkits. How do they link to user innovation, and how did you come up with these ideas to sort of complement and flesh out the idea of user innovation further? Yeah, well, lead users was, I think, maybe the first of the next steps. And that was because my marketing colleagues at MIT said, yeah, that's fine, but so what if they do it? Manufacturers are doing it too. And I was saying, yeah, but actually the users are leading the manufacturers. And you can find them and characterize them and so on. So that was sort of to say, when people were saying to me, oh, okay, if it exists, what good is it, right? And then uh, the things like sticky information and so on were tied in as well because they're all part of the theoretical structure explaining why users have an advantage. Users simply know things that producers don't know and they can't transfer that information by marketing research. They can't transfer how they feel as they're modifying a skateboard, you know? And the manufacturers, when it's only a dozen as opposed to a million, won't listen anyway. So the sequence is really in all these tools and so on. Again, colleagues, I mean, I, I really have to say, we've built a wonderful community here. And uh, anybody who's interested, uh, the open and user innovation uh, community that we built has annual meetings and it's very supportive. You know, you can go there and say, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And people will say, I was there not so long ago. Let me help you. So uh, it's, it's really nice. Yeah. Anyway. And, and in that community that has grown around the concept of user innovation, is there any of these sort of complementary concept that would be your favorite concept where you think that really enriches the core idea by a lot? It can be either one of your concepts or one of the concepts that one of your colleagues 
pioneered. Yeah. So all of us have been developing things in concert, like innovation toolkits, how to make it easier for users to innovate. Or, you know, uh, Christina Rosh did this thing about embedded lead users. You know, people in companies are also users. So what are they doing? And how can you sort of empower them within a company? And it's sort of fascinating because uh, uh, there's a conflict, it turns out. Uh, you know, if you're in a ski company and you're a fantastic skier and you're innovating as a user, the company often doesn't want that. Nah, too leading edge. No, don't want that. That's not the mass market. So it's, it's, it's interesting because often it's embarrassing for these people the level of product that their firms are still producing when they know where the field is going and they know this was so funny because rodeo kayaking was something developed by users that is kayaking in rough water. And many of these people who developed it worked for kayaking companies. And so an ordinary kayak is used for travel and you stay away from white water and you quote portage around waterfalls. These people were throwing themselves off waterfalls and uh, the manufacturers that they worked for said, no, that's not a kayak. You have to stop that. So they actively resisted it. And then these people went out and started their own companies and so on and so forth. So that's sort of how it goes. Uh, it's fascinating. So and in this community of user innovation scholars, any research community also lives from the idea of complementary ideas, but also of oppositional ideas. And this is how a field grows. Would you say that so far, all the other ideas that have emerged in that field are complementary? Or are there any oppositional ideas within the field of user innovation also? Well, I don't know that they're within it, but in many places we are disrupting things and uh, the fields are not interested. You know, marketing research, marketing research goes and tries to find needs. They say, we want to understand what you need. And meanwhile, this guy says, well, not only do I know what I need, but I built it. You know, here, here's an artificial pancreas. And then the marketing research people, because of their tools, say, no, 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 tell us what you need. We don't care what you built. That's our job. Just tell us what you need. And this is also true in academic research. Uh, you know, they're still doing conjoint analysis. They're still doing all. So it's more that um, the younger generation is sort of saying, hey, uh, maybe this is important and maybe I can make my name from it. And the older generation is saying, no, here's how you do things. And that's what my name is attached to. And uh, so it's, it's within the field. If you once drink the, drink the Kool-Aid, you know, then it's really building a giant structure. It's sort of saying, how does all this connect? How do strategies of firms pick up on the fact that the user innovations are out there being tested and nobody's looking? So how could you develop a strategy to pick up from users what they have already done for free? And then yourself as a manufacturer do the complementary things, you know, making it manufacturable, you know, making those kayaks, manufacturable. I mean, users were making them in molds in their backyards and uh, companies came in and said, whoa, we can rotationally mold these because we also make large trash bins out of plastic. And everybody said, oh, good. And, and, you know, so even though users develop these things, it doesn't mean they want to manufacture them for themselves, right? They are happy to not spend their weekends building, they want to spend their weekends kayaking. 
So they want manufacturers to pick it up if only manufacturers will pay attention. So it's a healthy research community of both academics, users, and companies. Can we <laughs> take that away? Um, yeah, I think a follow-up question could be for us from like more strategy organization point of view. We are more coming from like a pro producer innovation kind of perspective. Then how could we like integrate those concepts from user innovation into, for example, our research and how does that inform um, our communications with the organizations? We really need you guys. We really need you to, this is a whole new area of strategy. It is saying that innovations in part come from elsewhere. How do we organize a strategy that will take that into account? How do we change the structure of an organization so that it doesn't keep on trying to do it all itself? You know, so there are firms also that you and strategy can study like Lego. Lego knows that their customers innovate. So Lego has set up a system called Lego Ideas where user innovations are systematically gathered. In the area of uh, you know, video games, um, there's something called Steam Workshop set up by a company called Valve. It's so funny. It's a strategy choice again that they've made, but it's so funny because uh, in all of these places, users start out disrupting and manufacturers fight against them. And the role of strategy has to be to let's be systematic. So I'll just tell you a funny story with respect to um, video games. So manufacturers build video games. This is a video game. It's wonderful. Do not touch a thing. You may play it, but absolutely don't mess with it. So of course the users were challenged and they hacked the games. And uh, specifically there was one game that somehow tipped the whole thing over, which was, uh, it was called Castle Wolfenstein, which was a fierce American soldiers versus German soldiers in World War II. And they hacked, you know, that's how we all first person shoot or whatever. And they hacked it by, trading out all the soldiers for blue Smurfs, which are these fuzzy little blobs. And they called it Castle Smurfenstein. And it then happened that the manufacturers sort of gave up and said, oh, hell, we know you're gonna innovate. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the engine, that is the thing that you know, the physics engine. So the thing that when you throw the snowball, it makes a curve and all the people move and all the rest of that. And you guys design the game and we'll give you tools to do that. And we'll watch what you do. This is what happens in Steam Network, for example. We'll watch what you do and other people can download what you do. And when, something proves popular, we'll include it in our games for everyone. Because what I want to point out here, it's really important, is it's not everyone who innovates. It's a small fraction of people. Remember, it was like 6% of the population. It's a small fraction. So most people will want what the manufacturer turns around and produces as a standardized thing. What we're talking about here is innovation strategy, not manufacturing strategy, sales strategy. It's innovation strategy. And, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a big yeah. area. The example is very fascinating. And also when you talk about these users, often we think about them, they're quite willing to share whatever their solution it is. And I've also, we've also noticed that you, from user innovation, you kind of change your um, research theme to open source, where it's also the innovator who is willing to share what they find. Could you share a bit about your journey? Like how do you like shift your focus from user innovation to open source? What makes those shifts? 
Yeah, you know, these are lovely questions, you two, and thanks for preparing so well. So one of the things I noticed was that users innovate, right? But the other thing I noticed is that they were giving them away. So this is absolutely non-economist. This is non-Schumpeterian. This is non the teaching of entrepreneurship that is done in MBA schools even today. MBA schools say, if you find something, patent it, lock it down. Don't let anybody get near it, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's exactly. But the thing is that users are self-rewarded. When they build a skateboard, they did it to ride it, not to sell it. When the person, people, there was a whole bunch of people called uh, Night Scout who got together to build better tools to help their children with diabetes. Night Scout, these were people with kids who had diabetes. They weren't about to exclude anybody else who had a diabetic kid. It's like, no, I did this for my kid and I'm happy, happy to share with your kid. And, and uh, so what's happened and is, it's, it's really quite wonderful is we have been working on the economics of why this is because people in strategy and elsewhere in economics don't absorb this unless you can sort of say, well, why? why? Why are these people doing this very strange thing? They could sell it, you know. Why the heck are they giving it away? And uh, what we've been showing in a number of papers that there are many strategic reasons why you would want to give it away. So you can explain it. I mean, you know, and, and basically in the case of consumers, it's that it costs so much to lock it down and you've got something else to do. These people who developed the artificial pancreas, like were people who ran the engineering for chemical plants. You know, again, it is an artificial pancreas is sort of a little chemical plant. So they had a day job. They didn't want to you know, they had an opportunity cost. They, did, they, they didn't want to build an artificial pancreas. And, and, and so also it would be very hard to protect it from others because after all, you're sharing it in your community when you design it. So that's one reason. Another is that really it turns out, and this is really cool, I think, it, it turns out that even if you're a bunch of companies, you have inputs in common. So for example, uh, Facebook and uh, I guess you call it Meta and, and, and uh, uh, all these companies uh, like Google use what are called servers, right? Computer servers, they have these giant cloud things and the core of the cloud thing is all these individual little servers. So firms like IBM were designing these servers and selling them with an upcharge, with rent, with profit to all these firms. None of the firms were getting an advantage over any other firm by buying a server because anybody could buy the same advanced server. So they said to themselves, well, why the heck are we doing this? We've got engineers. We know what we want better than IBM does because we run these giant farms. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna open source the design of servers. And so they collaborated, there was just open source. They collaborated in a design that was like half the energy cost and efficient in terms of all the things that they had to do when running a server farm, like pulling things in and out, replacing them and all the rest. And then they said to the manufacturers, hey, you can make these for us as white goods. In other words, we're not paying you an extra profit for your design because we designed it. Now, what you find is kind of interesting. So this is a strategy thing again, right? This is a firm saying, 
okay, if we have an input in common, we're going to share it in common and design it openly. But if you think in strategy terms, everybody is in a supply chain. So everybody, the guys who buy your stuff are saying, wait a minute, that's a common input. I'm going to try to make that open source. And so openness is just spreading through the whole supply chain. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see. Uh, there's a paper I did with Alfonso Gambardella on that. It's pretty cool. It, um, so anyway, talking about that. So. Yeah, that's very fascinating story. And we also saw that like moving more recently, your work has been focusing on need solution pairs. Could you give a bit like um, explanation on like what does that mean and what, what drives you to this new topic? Yeah, so uh, a need solution pair is the need and the solution together. And the it, it relates to innovation again, because um, normally what they do in problem solving is they say, we have a problem, now let's find a solution. But often, in fact, and we've done lab stuff on this and so on, often in fact, the need and the solution come together. It's more like the guy who invented Velcro. He was looking at, I don't know if you know the story of Velcro, but this, this man, his, I think his name was de Mastral or something. He had a dog and they were walking in the field and the field was full of nettles. And the nettles stuck to the dog's fur and they stuck to his trousers. You know, these, you know what they are, these little round things with all these. So he put them under a microscope and he said, whoa, what the, oh my gosh, there are hooks on this thing. And what came to him simultaneously in effect was that's a solution to an attachment problem. He didn't say, I am searching for a new way to attach things together. The thing that became Velcro. Out of the blue, it was like, holy cow, look at this that could be used for that. And so um, it really is, again, uh, uh, within firms, they're always designed around find and need and fill it. If you think of the structure, it's marketing research, find the need, R&D, fill it, right? And in fact, it's, that's, that's not always the case, you know? And in fact, it's, often not the case. What, we, what we've shown is it's often not the case. So humans are amazing. They have this lovely way, this absolutely insane way of doing a behavior and assuming they're doing something else. So it is so funny. I love it. But I was interviewing top people at Ford and they were saying, uh, oh yeah, you know, we, we, we focus on objectives. Every year we set our objectives for the year and we write it down in a list and our boss makes us stick to that list. I said, okay, so let's look at the list. So we looked at the list. He said, well, you know, actually I haven't done any of those things. I did these other things that came up during the year. Uh, but you're still making these lists, right? <laughs> and what do you say to your boss? You know, what do you say to your boss when you haven't done anything on the list? He says, oh, we'll change the list. So, so, you know, we assume we're running from a set of fixed problems, but when we look at our behaviors, we're not. And so one of the things I love doing, and I think, many people love to do it too in our community, is we look at actual behaviors and we say, wait a minute now, what's really being done as opposed to the assumptions that have come down to us for so many years? So that's what that's about. Yeah, that's very fascinating. And I've seen you coming a lot of new ideas and new works still being published. So 
I think it's a, you are setting a very great role model for us as junior scholars to, for example, trying to challenge the existing assumptions and also building up a community, etc. I'm just wondering, is there any advice that you would give to any aspiring scholars that may similarly I mean to challenging some existing paradigms and to to voice out their own thoughts about something that may not make sense in a certain extent? I think. Uh, research is also a community occupation. So I've been helped a lot by mentors over the years, Svi Grilikis, Richard Nelson, others. So I think as young scholars, if you get an idea that you think is interesting, or if you see one out there that you think is interesting, find somebody to talk to, you know, there's within the field, there's also often within academia, there's a feeling, oh my God, if I reveal this, somebody will steal it. No, everybody thinks their own ideas are much better than yours. Certainly they, nobody's stolen my ideas, right? <laughs> they wouldn't want to. So, so in the community that we have built, if you come to that, Nobody has ever stolen anything. Everybody helps. So come with your wishes or your needs and ask and ask even senior scholars. Just ask. You know, I help a lot of people every year. And so do my colleagues. You know, they just write and they say, oh God, you know, I'm trying to do this or that, or I have this idea. What do you think? And then you know, they worry sometimes that I'm going to say, oh, yeah, now I'll be your co-author. No way. I just want to help. And, and that sort of is, is something that you as young scholars should use. Because sometimes you're so afraid that, oh, God, how do I, how do I make it in this world? The answer is the world wants to help you. It's open source. That is amazing advice, Eric. Uh, thank you so much. And, and to carry that spirit forward, we want to open up the discussion also to the audience yet a bit. So perhaps some of you have any question you would want to ask Eric about advice on, or you have any questions regarding Eric's work, please or feel have free. Or answers. You can apply <laughs> answers or objections. Or answers. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Uh, happy to pick you up on that offer to just ask questions right away. Uh, my name is David. I'm a PhD candidate at the Technical University of Munich. Um, my own work is around the introduction of new technologies into processes of innovation and organization. And so my question is tying that into your ideas of finding need solution pairs, for example, and creating new, new innovation. How do you see the role of humans changing in the future as we have more and more data in the world, we have new technology that might be able to take over some of these processes of innovation. What's, what's left for humans to do and how will humans be able to still position themselves maybe and uh, what's, what's the relevance of humans in this modern world of innovation? Yeah, I mean, that's a large and complicated question. And so normally what I would do, and you're welcome to, I'll spend half an hour with you. What I try to do when I try to answer a question like this is I try to say, well, why are you asking it? You know, what is your, you, you have certain research insights, just like I did about user innovation. And building off your research insights is what you want to do. And so when you talk to me about this, I'll say, well, why do you want to know? You know, what's, what's behind this? And then out of that will come a research project that is truly yours because it plays to your interests and your strengths. Now, specifically, uh, what are we gonna do when the universe changes and AI takes over? I don't know, it's really interesting because um, you know, uh, we are now developing a really fast, easy way to find user innovations using GPT-3. It's text-based. Anybody can enter it and uh, say, hey, I want a user innovation in the field of windsurfing or whatever. And the thing will, having looked over the whole web, will say, hey, here's some. Now, 
What this does is it democratizes innovation. It gives more people the opportunity to do interesting things. So I would think, you know, but we have to discuss all the definitions and so on. I would think actually uh, what it's gonna do is empower us. It's, it's going to be sort of a shared process where the machine does what it does and we do what we do and we have our own interests. Machine doesn't have our interests. So we will sort of be learning in ways the machine will not. But again, feel free to, free, feel free to send me a note and we can chat. We may have time for maybe two more questions. Um, is there anyone? Yeah, sure. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Marike. I'm an associate prof at the HEC Paris. Um, thanks for, for the presentation. Um, uh, yeah, we really loved it. Um, I wanted to maybe pick you up on the last idea about the need solution pairs. Um, and when I was listening to you, um, I was thinking of our students at the HEC. Uh, and I was thinking what kinds of skills, because to be able to be very free in, in your mind and not be stuck with clear objectives and goals, what kinds of skills do we need to teach our students to be able to be more effective at recognizing these need solution pairs? It's an interesting question. And, and again, we should chat about it. Um, because when we look at people to whom these things occur, it's not like they're in general good at it. It's like they happen to be having the right sticky information at the right moment. So and therefore, I don't know whether the issue is teaching them how to do it as opposed to recognize when others have done it and what to do with that. Um, so here's an example that you might love. I don't know. Uh, many people ride bicycles. Some of those people, for reasons known best to themselves, uh, ride bicycles across Texas in the middle of the summer in a race. Now, when they do that, they get thirsty, as you can imagine. But if you're in a bike race, I suppose you all know that bottom brackets, you know, on bicycles, there are these brackets where you have a water bottle. That's a mess. You have to let go of one hand of this thing. You have to raise it up and so on and so forth. There was a guy, Michael Edson, I think was his name. And maybe you've heard of Camelback, where you have a water container on your back of your shirt and a tube that you suck through. Now, Michael was thirsty, as were many of these bikers, but Michael also was an EMT, an emergency medical technician. He was used to hydrating people. He had bags of saline in his truck and he had surgical hose. So what he did was at the beginning of the race, he took one of those bags, filled it with plain water, attached it to the back of his T-shirt and took a tube. So the point was, he saw that as a combination, but he was well positioned to see it. It's like they say about Fleming, nature favors the prepared mind. So I think what you have to do is think of this as a process that occurs widely distributed and how do you recognize it and then benefit from it as a corporate strategy? One final question. Uh, thanks so much. I'm the PhD candidate in University of Cambridge. And uh, I really appreciate your thought on you know, really sharing the ideas and asking people who are more senior than you. But uh, actually I originally think so, but uh, my girlfriend told me that, you know, you only have very limited ideas. You should not, uh, you know, talk to everybody about what you you do. Um, I mean, in, I originally in one like uh, a community, and I basically talking to everyone about what I'm doing. And uh, my girlfriend think is, uh, you know, not so appropriate. How would you find that? You should I talk to everybody, or are there any approaches in? Yeah. 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 Thanks so much. So, so first of all, always listen to your girlfriend. It's always very good advice. Um, but I think that young scholars, I mean, certainly people do steal stuff. 
and uh, young scholars especially have less of a way to push back, you know, because they're young and not known yet. So um, I think you have to pay attention to the behavior of the community that you're revealing in. As I say, our open and user innovation community is very well trained on, no, you don't take other people's stuff, but there may be other communities where there's a risk. So I guess my advice to you would be to assess, assess the risk, not, not adopt the general hiding strategy that your girlfriend would suggest, but rather be as sister and strategy strategic about it. Uh, choose the people where, where the incentives are right and the behavior, the revealed preference is right. I just realized we actually have a bit more time than I thought we would. Uh, so in case they're like, I think we can accommodate two more questions or so if um, anyone else has any questions to Eric. With my long answers. <laughs> Yeah, we have one more person, okay. or perhaps two. No pressure. Okay, we mix it up a bit. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much, Eric, for uh, the uh, interview, and thanks uh, to the uh, PhD students who actually organized the interview as well. Um, I, Sung uh, Hoon, I'm from Bocconi. I'm uh, currently a job market candidate, and uh, I just wanted to know, um, like, in, in your point of view, um, uh, when do, from the existence of the uh, user innovation, right? Uh, part, I mean, part of the uh, part of the uh, implications you also mentioned at the time was that uh, you know, instead of uh, the innovation being focused on being just the producers, like uh, like the firms, like uh, uh, your, the contribution of that concept was basically that the users also are a heavy Heavily, heavily influenced uh, innovation as well. Uh, what I was sort of wondering was, uh, would you would you say this would this has also like a sort of a sort of like a, a far reaching consequences when it comes to like the uh, how the uh, like a, like an industry maybe evolves over time? So, like normally when you talk about like how the industry evolves, uh, what usually happens is uh, we say things like it's a very Schumpeterian thing, isn't it? It's like uh, you know the firms uh, innovate or don't don't innovate because of uh, certain factors, and that leads to like uh, maturity at some stage, and then like entries and exit patterns that change over time. Uh, would you say uh, user innovation could also uh, impact that in sort of a fundamental manner compared to uh, just focusing on just the firm innovation? Thank you. Yeah, no, very good question. And so that we've we've studied the sort of the evolution of innovations that users do. And what you see is that first users will do it like skateboards or mountain bikes or heart lung machines. And then what will happen is that somebody at a small scale who's in that community will say, oh, okay, now I'll start manufacturing it as a small firm. I see that there's room for me. And then what will happen is that this is basically an increasing signal uh, as to uh, the availability of a market and then bigger and bigger firms will enter. So specifically, for example, just to get away from consumer innovations for a moment, because users who are professionals also innovate. In the case of the heart lung machine, no existing medical equipment company wanted to do it, but it was necessary to change heart valves and so on. So a doctor did it, a surgeon, over 10 years with, with, with grants. Other surgeons, when they saw that he had success, said, can I come to your surgery and see what you're doing? He said, sure. They came. They said, can I get my technician to build a machine like yours? He said, sure, gave him a roll of drawings. And eventually one of those technicians started a company because why should everybody try to build it in the hospital basement? And then over time, bigger firms came in. Now, I want to say one more thing, which is producers also innovate, but they innovate on dimensions of merit. 
So the user finds the new function, creates the market. And then what happens is the producer says, I'll make it better for you. So I'll make this kludgy heart lung machine into something more reliable, right? Everybody wants it to be more reliable, make it easy to sanitize and so on and so forth. I'll make a skateboard for you that it has a deck out of carbon fiber. But notice that the function is always by users. So again, to go to skateboards, have you ever noticed that the deck is curved? And I'm maybe taking too much time here, I don't know. Have you ever noticed the tips of the thing are curved? So there were flat skateboards, manufacturers were making them, flat decks. Users discovered they could get air. They could stamp down behind the wheels and the thing would go up. So the users then said, oh, if I curve the back and the front, I can get more air because there's more room to stamp down. And the manufacturers said, oh, okay, we'll copy that. So the manufacturers were the inventors of things like putting ball bearings on the wheels so they would roll better. That's not a novel function. That's doing the function that's already there better, right? But the users innovated the skateboard and they innovated novel function like jumping and changed the skateboard as a consequence. So I've forgotten your question by this time. I hope it helped. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was great. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. I, I think we had um, one more um, question. I think um, you were first. Um, and uh, I think that has to be, unfortunately, the last question. After that, we need to. OK. Um. So, um, Professor Van Hippel, I wanted to ask about um, today's big challenges. Um, if I look around, um, it has to do with social fragmentation, inequalities, educational systems that are breaking, um, climate change cl clearly. And so a lot of the new ideas in my view that we need are perhaps more behavioral. And um, so perhaps slightly uh, complementary to many of the more uh, product innovations that you've been uh, talking about. And so my question would be more, how do we get, because to me also the it's the users of care of uh, that can come up with new models, new ways of bringing people together um, um, and so forth. So how do we how do we encourage people um, to to perhaps search for new approaches that really address those kinds of more societal issues? Um, and and can we learn something from all 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 the practices of our user? Uh, innovation experiences from user innovations uh, to to actually take ideas and and try to you know if, if we want our governments to <laughs> set their new innovation policies in a way that actually motivates more citizens to take action in these domains, um, what should we tell them? So uh, let me separate your your question into two, if I may. The first one is behavioral innovations. You know, in other words, yes, we've been talking about products the whole time. But my very clever daughter, Christiana von Hippel, uh, did research uh, in the area of behaviors. You know, what do users do with behaviors? So she looked specifically in the area of uh, childcare. You know, how do you take care of your child under the following circumstances? And looked at Reddit and so on. And what she found was that the behaviors were what people were describing. And it's so cool and so important, right? Because we all have sort of behaviors that is practices, whatever you want to call them, techniques. And I'll just share one with you, but it's, it's a micro one, but it struck me as so interesting. Uh, there is a, there's a site on Reddit devoted to mothers of twins. No, sorry, triplets. And the question is, how on earth, you're exhausted, how on earth, how on earth do you know which one you fed? They're all crying. Oh my God, what do you do? And they're twins, they look alike. You give them all different colored hats. So when you wake up at night, absolutely exhausted, you say, ah, 
I fed the purple one last time. Uh, let's see, where's the yellow one over here? And I'll feed that one. So, so small to big behaviors. Now, with respect to your point about large uh, government responses and so on, there are firms who do crowdsourcing and organize this kind of thing. The, in my experience, that's not very good yet. And you could do work on it because the question is ill-defined and the system is ill-defined and it's sort of like more performative. It's look, we're thinking, we're trying to listen to you, but, but I never found that to be of high quality. So this is an area that I'd be grateful if you researched in as to how to do this, because I don't know. And I don't think anybody else in the field knows. So it's gotta be you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Eric, for this um, and for enlightening us with your wisdom. I think we have learned all a whole lot in this uh, session. And I think uh, Liz has like some final words to close this session. Actually, hi, Eric, it's Liz. Uh, hey. Actually, I was going to ask you one more question. Just with, uh, I know we're now standing between uh, us and lunch here, and probably okay. you, you and breakfast. But um, earlier today, we had a, we did a panel, and I asked the we asked the panelists uh, this question, and I'm curious if you can, you can reject the question if you'd like, or pass on the question. But the question is, if you had um, two or three doctoral students right now, and so this builds on what you were just saying. So you have two or three doctoral students. They're going to start right now. They have seven years. They have access to any data in the world and any resources. And now fast forward and it's 2030 and you're sitting at their defense for their dissertation. What would you like them to have studied? And what would you like them to have kind of figured out? So what would make you thrilled like, oh, they did this either. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's wonderful. I think the really exciting topic, well, there are many exciting topics. There really are. You take your specialty whatever it is, and, and you'll find something, you know, we can chat about it, whatever. But uh, I would be, the tools for integrating user innovators now with producers and democratizing innovation through AI are moving ahead so rapidly that I think that I would be very excited if those people did work on uh, sort of the new case where we're all gonna be able to be much more empowered with respect to innovation due to AI assisting us. It's, it's analogous to the low code, no code movement and so on. It's a huge democratization that's going on. And so it will, it will, it will render companies I think less important on the innovation scene, you know, or, or accelerate the whole process I've mentioned, you know, of producers and so on. So, so I don't know, but I, I, I would be excited by that. Great. Super helpful. Okay. Uh, with that, again, I just wanted to thank you, Eric, for um, taking the time and being so thoughtful and so generous, not only here, but with your, um, offers to help those in the room and, and others going forward. You've always been incredibly generous with your time, I know, for me and with my colleagues as well. And again, a huge thank you to uh, Nettie and Jens Christian for your work on this. So thank you all very much. And we're a few minutes early, so I'd recommend going to lunch early since uh, we have enough people here. So thanks again. Okay, you're welcome. Nice to see you. And again, thanks, Nettie, and thanks, Jens. You did a great job. Thank you, Eric. And Liz, thanks for inviting me. No <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs>